Very, very well. Uh, now, uh, I don't think you're going to be answer, able to answer these questions, but we may be able to put some clarity on it. I'm really, really concerned that the entire narrative around Omicron is, oh, look how the cases are multiplying. Look, the cases are soaring. Oh, hospitalizations going up. Uh, so I keep saying, I keep saying on social media, what are the symptoms? Is it lethal? Has anyone died from it? Newspapers are putting up fact files. Our experts answer all your questions. Well, my question is this. Is it lethal? And what are the symptoms? No one is answering these questions. Are we able to do that? I, I just don't think we are, Kevin. I mean, we're not being given any details at all down at the front line, as it were. And I did speak to somebody tonight who I actually thought to myself, mm, is this our first case of Omicron? because their only symptom was a fatigue that had floored them for a week, nothing else at all. And we are hearing from South Africa that that seems to be one of the overriding symptoms. But the problem with that, of course, is I would normally get somebody to have a PCR test, but if they go onto the NHS website and try and order a PCR test and say that they don't have a fever or a dry cough, um, or a change in their sense of smell, they won't get a test. So there's problems all around. But from what I'm hearing is there are very few symptoms. Exactly. The indications are that the symptoms are relatively, mercifully mild. Uh, so let's keep our fingers crossed for that. But I, at the same time, I do think it's incumbent upon the government. I mean, we've got 284, 300 cases now. They could tell us what the symptoms are. Couldn't they? Why don't they? Why don't they tell us uh, what looks like to be the case that no one in the entire world has died from it? Why are they talking about waiting to find out how dangerous Omicron is as opposed to waiting to find out how undangerous it is? Why the pessimistic narrative? Why will they not entertain the possibility that this could be quite good news? So I guess there are two answers to that, aren't there? Firstly, with COVID, we have seen all the way through that there's always a lag from people who get it to how long it takes them to get into hospital. So they're probably waiting to see what happens in three weeks' time to see whether or not there's any pattern there. But the data that they're getting from other countries where we have this now, I mean, I think Holland think that they've had it long before those flights came in from South Africa. The data that we're seeing from other countries suggests that people are not dying from it. There doesn't appear to have been that we know one death at the moment. So for me, like you, I have to ask, well, why wouldn't we share that good news? Because it's good news, isn't it? Yeah. We don't want people to die. We never have wanted people to die. But why would we not share it? Well, being the cynical person that I've become over these last 20 months, <laughs> I think it's because they want more people to be scared by it and go out and get more vaccines. Right. That's all it can be. It's another coercion to go out and get boosted because I think there are not as many people taking up the booster that they would like. And so this is kind of their last chance saloon to get people to do that. Well, the word is 83 percent of people have been double vaccinated. Ninety three percent of the population have been va vaccinated at least once. I mean, how many, you know, how much further can you go than that? I mean, you're never going to get to the point where every single citizen of this country has been double vaxxed or boosted as well. Uh, what is this obsession with the booster? Will it make any difference? So this is really, I mean, this is perplexing, isn't it? Because every year we have at least 20,000 people die of flu in bad years, 50,000. And we never have a massive uptake of the flu vaccine especially amongst healthcare workers, ironically enough, you know, so the coverage we get is about 50, 60%, but nobody ever forces and forces this on us. Now, I know COVID has been much bigger and it's been around the world, Kevin, but I don't know what the obsession is. Surely, at the beginning, when people were dying because they had no vaccines, we didn't have the treatments, we didn't know how to properly treat them, all we wanted to do was stop people dying. If we now accept that we have vaccinated twice at least, for some, for some three times, then surely we've done what we need to do to stop the people who might die from dying. And that has to be the end game, surely. Indeed. Uh, what, what do you think uh, of uh, Oliver Dowden, the Tory party chairman, as he came on to talk radio last Friday and uh, his answer to Julia Hartley Brewer's question is still ringing in my ears. Uh, she said, can you rule out for us uh, that the uh, prospect 
of mandatory vaccines in Britain. Can you tell us that that will never happen, that we will never uh, follow the line of uh, Austria and Germany and probably increasing the uh, number of countries? Don't forget uh, Ursula von der Leyen, the EU commissioner, says the entire EU should consider it. Uh, that'll be our lucky break because we won't have to do it. Uh, uh, but he, Oliver Dowden refused to rule out the prospect of compulsory injection by government order in uh, the country of the United Kingdom. What do you think about that? I think it's absolutely disgusting. You know my views on mandating vaccines. It's up to us as healthcare professionals to convince people to want a vaccine, not to force them. I think Oliver Dowden was just using even more nudge techniques to just get more people to go along and have more vaccine. And I think the more they do this, the more cynical people are going to get. They're going to wonder why they're trying so hard, especially now they hear of this new variant, which allegedly is much milder, and that is the pattern that viruses normally take. Mm. So I think it's disgusting. I think Boris should come out and say categorically, Oliver was wrong. We're not going to mandate vaccines. We're asking you to please go and get them and then leave it for people to make their own decisions about their own body and their own health. This is the whole point, is it, on a general basis? I totally agree with you, uh, Rene. I, I, I've said I, I think it's time for the people of this country to demand from our government a cast iron guarantee that they will never make the COVID vaccine mandatory because we'll cross the Rubicon if that happens. That's not British. So I think we should demand that. Uh, but uh, in terms of the actual symptoms, we were discussing this earlier. You know, as I say, they've got nearly 300 cases in this country. We're told they've got, you know, uh, untold number of cases in uh, South Africa, although that number remains mysterious as well. We keep getting told, oh, the cases are really soaring. From what to what? What are the numbers? However, there's a substantial number of people have obviously had Omicron. Why can't they tell us what the symptoms are? Exactly. And we need to. People need, you know, good news. And they need it now. They don't need it in two weeks time or on the 20th of December so that they know they can have Christmas. They need it now. You know, I was talking to the receptionist at my practice this evening and they're starting to worry that, that their Christmas dinner is going to be cancelled. And it might sound like a small thing, but they've worked bloody hard all year. And it's the one thing they're looking forward to. And why should they not have it? You know, they've actually all had COVID. They've all been vaccinated. They've all taken, you know, all the care they can to be as safe as they can. So now it's time to actually give people back their lives and let them live it. Indeed. Uh, in terms of this kind of uh, general Armageddon-like atmosphere of uh, doom and gloom uh, being perpetuated by our government, by the way, I mean, these Saturday press briefings totally unnecessary they never say anything old Sajid Javid making another one of his emergency statements that didn't amount to a hill of beans we're still waiting to find out what it is really you know I mean it's just hopeless uh so uh that atmosphere I don't think is in any way uh useful and I'm wondering what you think now Sarah Gilbert obviously the hero of the vaccines and all that uh but uh you know, I suppose she's asked a question, she gave an answer, but it, it is depressing to see her all over the front page saying, uh, oh, the next pandemic could be far more lethal than this one. How much longer are we going to go on like this? Do you know what I felt about that interview? And I do have respect for Sarah Gilbert course, and everything yeah. she did. And especially as she said, you know, she was honest enough to say we shouldn't be giving boosters. We should be sending them to the people who have no vaccines. And I agree. But I just felt that the tenor of her article was, you know, we scientists, we've been at the forefront of this. We've had a voice which we've never had before. And we don't want to lose that. Um, and so my justification for that is that let's tell everybody that the next pandemic may be worse, which of course it may be, it may not be, um, because you mustn't shut us back in the cupboard, as it were. And I just felt quite deflated by that, actually, because I think one of the things that people have got really tired of over this last 20 months is scientists that they don't know, that they didn't vote for, actually making decisions which materially affect people's lives. And I don't think we want that, and I don't think we should want that. And the last question, Rene, I um, look forward to see you on Thursday, as always. Uh, you'll be in the studio here. But uh, before that, uh, learning to live with COVID amounts to this. Um, we're talking about Sarah Gilbert's type of interview that she gave. You know, the scientists are in charge. Leave it to us. We'll, we'll protect you. We'll look after your health. No, no, no. 
we have to we should recall what life was like before the covid crisis uh, when uh, guess what uh, individuals made their own choices about their medical uh, decisions and their own health uh, that we've got to somehow or other shake this government and scientists like Sarah Gilbert out of the idea that they're in charge of our medical welfare they're not are they they're not. And actually, Kevin, I think this leads nicely into something that happened this weekend. And actually, Chair Kavanagh just went there a little bit, which is that we saw doctors this weekend saying how angry they were at patients who hadn't been vaccinated, who were in hospital with COVID. And my immediate thought to that is, firstly, doctors shouldn't be angry at any patient ever for their lifestyle choices. We are trained as doctors to treat all patients equitably and to never be judgmental. But suddenly it's OK for doctors to be all over the front of the paper saying they're angry with people for not having a vaccine. But they're not angry with people who smoke or eat too much or drive their car too fast or drink too much alcohol and end up in hospital. Just the people that haven't had vaccines. And frankly, it's time for doctors to stop all of this, step back and do what we're meant to do treat patients come what may and that means letting people make a decision about their vaccine status and live with the consequences absolutely renee great to talk to you thank you so much for your time dr 